Welcome to the Fantasy Football Factory Podcast Championship Weekend Wrap-Up Edition, presented by the fine folks at Miller Light. I'm one of your hosts, Barstool Mincy. Joined, as always, by the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Shea, Stephen Shea, joining us. How are you today? Doing great. Victory Monday. We'll get into all that momentarily. We got to thank Miller Light. So this is our season finale. This is the last episode this, uh, I don't want to say year because it's technically a new year, but this season of Fantasy Football Factory. So we want to thank our presenting sponsor, Miller Light. They've been with us every step of the way. Cheers to keeping things uncomplicated. Since 1975, Miller Lite has been the beer with taste you can depend on. No games, no gimmicks, just great beer for people who like beer. People like you and your friends, whether you're in person or not, you can count on Miller Lite to bring you and your friends together for Miller time. Miller Lite, great taste, 96 calories. Go to MillerLite.com forward slash fantasy to find delivery options near you, or you can pick up Miller Lite pretty much anywhere they sell beer. It's Miller time. And a reminder to celebrate responsibly. Milwaukee, Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 96 calories, 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. And we're both celebrating with a lot of Miller times yesterday. Jamar Chase had three Miller times. We'll get into that momentarily. Um, but both of us, we'll get into this shortly after, um, we're champions. So we get to crack some Miller lights in celebration. Um, but a wild, wild weekend. We'll talk about everything fantasy playoff worthy. But yesterday, I got a dose of Tom Brady and Gronk and the box world champs, the world champs sweatshirt right now in person. But I was also there firsthand to see Antonio Brown melt down and see him exit the stadium. Literally, it was a crazy day. I mean, I was very excited for the game. I hadn't seen this team in person in two plus years. The last game I went to was uh, 2019 when Jameis Winston was a quarterback. It was like week two or three. Uh, it was in Tampa and then obviously no fans last year. And uh, yeah, it was great to see. I was uh, on field pregame, got in at 11 a.m. That's why I did Dear Mr. Fantasy early. Uh, saw a bunch of my buddies uh, on the team with the team and got to catch up with everybody, which was great. And was feeling good. I was on the sideline. I was watching AB warm up. He looked great. He tweaked an ankle in practice. And so I listen. Actually, this is a good question for you, Mitzi. Do you listen to the Saints press conferences? Uh, not. I watch so I'll, I'll watch some of Sean Payton's a little. Okay. That's about it. All right, so I watch every press. I don't. I don't know if people do that, um, but I watch every press conference that comes out. The players, the coaches, whatever. These are normally like you know you get post game. There's you know four to six guys for you know five minutes or less each and then you know there's a couple throughout the week with some coaches assistant coaches whatever but in those press conferences they mentioned that antonio brown tweaked an ankle this week but that he was probably okay to go so i'm on the sideline i'm watching i'm paying kind of close attention to antonio brown and mike evans specifically mike evans didn't warm up with the team until the second half so there's like uh, an initial warm-up where guys can go out and kind of work individually. Uh, then they'll go back in the locker room. And they're going to come out and do like team drills. So Mike Evans was not out there initially. So I was kind of nervous about him. I heard that he was going to play like 20 to 25 snaps. So from a fantasy perspective, I was like ah, a little cool on Mike Evans. He did score a touchdown. Um, he didn't have like a, a crazy day. I think he probably uh, was right around double digits from half point PPR. But Antonio Brown, I was paying very close attention to because I knew that he tweaked an ankle. It seemed like he'd be back and, and be OK. They specifically asked about that and they, they thought that he would be good to go. He looked great. He looked in great spirits. He was interacting with a ton of fans um, and everything looked good. So then went to the seats and things were not good at all. The, the Bucks got down big early. There was a, a crazy situation where. Some of the DBs tested positive for COVID earlier in the week. They then tested negative uh, outside of the window and then were able to play two of our three starting cornerbacks. They were supposed to fly out Sunday morning. Flight got delayed because the pilot tested positive for COVID that morning. So they had to get a new pilot to charter a plane. Uh, there were some weather issues, so they got rerouted to Canada and then had to fly back to MetLife. They landed in Newark Airport around 1235, 1240, and then had a police escort to the game, but they missed the whole first series. So just a crazy, crazy day. Uh, the Jets scored on that first series and went up uh, and then really didn't relinquish the lead for a while. They were up 24-10 in the third quarter, and that's where things kind of melted down. 
I went back last night to try, you know, I'm, I'm at the game. I'm focused on the field and what's going on. Antonio Brown didn't play in the second half. He played one play. It was a third and 20 nondescript play. I only saw a TV copy um, rewatching, like knowing what I'm looking for. And I didn't see anything wrong. He ran a route. Tom Brady didn't necessarily look his way. Looked to Mike Evans. It was incomplete. Went on the sidelines, whatever. Five minutes later, he's ripping his jersey off and, you know, throwing it and throwing off his undershirts and gloves to the crowd. So I don't know what's going on at this time. All I'm seeing is stuff on social media and people tagging me left and right and Big Cat asking me to do an emergency press conference. I don't know what's happening. (laughs) I'm completely focused on the game. We're getting our ass kicked. We score on that drive to make it 24-17. So it's like, okay, now we got a legitimate shot. So I'm very focused on this game. And then I'm seeing these videos of Antonio Brown surface of him leaving the field. And then in the stadium, they played it. So they played the Fox broadcast, the clip of him leaving. (laughs) And everyone was just kind of confused. A few people saw it that were kind of by him and by that end zone. But if it's hard to kind of make sense. So I'm I'm probably sitting at like the 30-yard line of the far end zone of where he leaves and the actions going on probably about the 30 or 40 yard line. Um, and this happens on the far end zone. So I'm actually, I don't see any of it live. I just see, you know, what people are tagging me in. And then you know, I see Dave's kind of talking about how I have no accountability. I'm totally locked in the game. I started texting people. I know with the team to be like, Hey, what happened? And the truth of the matter is nobody knew. And the reason is because the only people that knew were like Mike Evans, Bruce Arians. It looks like our punter was right there. And that's really it. Like this all happened on the sidelines. The coaches, the players, they don't have their phones. They're not texting people. There's no real time information. Like Jen Hale was on the sideline uh, reporter for like injury duty and stuff like that. And she just kind of wrapped up what was shown on the broadcast and what happened. None of it really came out. So what It appears to have happened, and Bruce Arians, you know, after the game, Bruce Arians announced that he had been cut uh, and that he's no longer a buck. Makes sense. But what happened is that Bruce Arians is saying that he asked Antonio Brown to go in the game. Antonio Brown refused. He asked him again later. He also refused. And then he, like, kind of blew a gasket and left. And then Bruce Arians said he had that look in his eyes that I hadn't seen in a very long time. I don't know what that means. I subscribe to Big Cat's. I way of thinking of we're not diagnosing this guy. With, you can't, nobody has the qualifications to diagnose this guy with CT. So you don't know what he's going through. People that are close to him, like Le'Veon Bell and Tom Brady allude to, he's going through a very hard time. You just want to kind of be empathetic to him. I kind of lean that way. Like we don't know what's going on with Antonio Brown. He is a malcontent. He has had issues that have been public, whether they've done it Instagram live, um, whether they've been kind of like court cases and accusations and things like that. It was on his draft report too. Like this isn't like a new right. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. The, the, he had a lot of baggage coming out of college and, you know, they kind of subsided as he grew to, you know, from this very humble kid that worked really hard to the superstar that kind of grew. And then there's obviously the hit from Vontae's perfect that everyone kind of points to as like the turning point. Is it coincidental? Is that the reason? Nobody knows and nobody can prove that at this point. But it's a sad turn of events because right now, from a football perspective, he is needed. Like Chris Godwin's after the year, he is needed as like the number two guy to take attention off Mike Evans. The football team on the field will take a hit. Now, will our locker room improve? Will their coach improve because of all this? Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Um, they. I, what I will say is I thought it was a very good test of character and Mike Evans especially stood out because he's the one guy that very much knew what happened because there's the video of him trying to convince Antonio Brown to not walk off the field and then he sees him rip his jersey off and Evans kind of you know goes back to playing the game. The next play was third and six and Mike Evans makes a first down catch. Huge play right after this happens. Right after he sees Antonio Brown run off the field. First down catch. The Bucks go on to score that drive. My boy Cam Brate. 24-17. We obviously go on to win the game. Everybody knows that. But a true test to the character. Brashad Perryman had a big catch um, later in that drive. Cyril Grayson obviously caught the game winner. Had a huge third and 20 before that. So I think we're going to be okay. But it's a, it's a crazy situation. And then obviously, you know, the Uber driver. Shout out Danny Boy Hustlehard was on part of my take this morning. So, um 
a lot of stuff going on. Hope Antonio Brown, hope the best for him. I want to thank him for his contributions to the team. Everyone's shitting on him <laughs> and being like, oh, this is like there was a, a writer for The Athletic, Lindsay Jones. Mincy, did you see this? No. So she I also also vehemently do not support the athletic. So okay, well, this is not supporting the athletic. Um, <laughs> she wrote an article, um, and to be fair, it wasn't a bad article. But in it, she wrote Brown might have helped deliver the Bucks a Super Bowl championship last season, but at what cost to Arians' credibility? Oof. Bruce Arians won a fucking Super Bowl, like. <laughs> That's his credibility. <laughs> like, and there is precedent for this with the Bucks. So in 2002, the Bucks win a Super Bowl. Great defense. Offense was good. Keyshawn Johnson, Keenan McCardell, Brad Johnson, John Gruden, etc. The next year, 2003, Keyshawn Johnson gets into several public disputes with John Gruden on the sideline, gets deactivated. Oof. Let go from the team. This happened to us. 18 years ago. Nobody remembers that. We remember the 2002 championship. So let me politely say, Lindsey Jones, shut up. <laughs> well, I don't see how you can call Arian, the Arian's credibility into play is a joke. It's, we won a fucking championship. Yeah, and Arian's, look, Arian's, let's not forget Arian's the offensive coordinator in the Steelers and coached Antonio Brown. Yeah. So, he was giving the guy a second chance. He knew the guy well. He obviously coached him, who he had flourished under him. And Tom Brady liked Antonio Brown. Look, you can't blame anybody for any of that. Brown came in, contributed the Super Bowl, was very good this year. I, I, I think it just sucks, like you said. It's unfortunate to see somebody's life kind of unravel like this, especially when they're literally a Hall of Fame talent. I yeah. mean, Brown, when he was playing at the peak of his Steelers career before it went on bad, he was the best receiver in the NFL. I don't know if he's going to get into the Hall of Fame now because he has so many enemies, but he has a Hall of Fame resume for sure right now. Like he could not play another down, which I doubt he will. And his resume, if he was just John Doe, is a Hall of Famer. How do you go from a Hall of Famer to taking an Uber from the game? So I actually wasn't an Uber. It was was a friend of a friend who picked him up. Um, But yeah, it is. It's a wild situation. And... Yeah, I, my thoughts are I hope Antonio Brown gets the, you know, whatever help he needs and, and can make him happy. I do want to thank him for his contributions to the Super Bowl team. He definitely he caught touch on the Super Bowl. He made a lot of plays when um, Chris Godwin and Mike Evans were out towards the end of last year. So I thought it was a great signing. I also thought re-signing him was a great move. The point people can uh, or the thing people can point to is this year, Chris Godwin has that unfortunate injury against the saints and antonio brown is still suspended at that point so the conversation is do you bring him back technically bruce arian said you know one mistake and he's gone obviously a fake vaccination card that causes you to get suspended and endangers your teammates is a mistake they kept him i get how you can point to that on the field which is what you hang banners for he helps the team and with the position that he plays basically a need with Chris Godwin being out. I don't disagree with the decision at all. And Bruce Arians said, I can give a shit what people think about it. And I think that's the right move. He also has great chemistry with Tom Brady. And when, huh? you know, when Godwin went down, I mean, how could you not go to him? Look, yeah. no, no blame, no blame from here. And I'm no Bucks fan. I mean, I, I get what Arians is doing and, it's just it's a tough break, though, how the Bucs are going to adjust. I mean, I know, like you said, you got a couple of young guys, but losing Godwin and him is going to be going to be kind of tough. Yeah, and Evans is gimpy right now. So, yeah, it's not good. Gronk stepped up and played huge. Cyril Grayson was – he's been a revelation the past few weeks. And honestly, he looks like Antonio Brown on the field. So, um, And Tom Brady trusts him. He's not Antonio Brown, but he's played pretty well the past few weeks. Hopefully, he can keep it up. Um, let's talk about a huge day. For the Cincinnati Bengals, your guys, the Bayou Bengals, Man. with a statement W5 ever seen one. 
What a game, too. And I said this last week. Remember on the pod last week, I said, I've never been more excited for a non-Saints regular season yes. game yeah. in years. You debated and not that, going to the to the Saints game. Yeah, the Saints game got moved to 325, so I could watch – I watched Chiefs <laughs> – I was watching it at a tailgate, too. And, uh, yeah, and it was 28-14 Chiefs to the half. And I was in my fantasy championship with Mahomes and Jamar Chase. Mahomes had a good first half, and then Chase busts the 72 yarder. And then the second half, man, the Bengals defense, you know, a lot of the story is obviously going to be Chase, but it was 28 14 at the half, or 28 17 at the half. And the Bengals defense shut down the Chiefs in the second half for them to come back. And then Jamar Chase, though, I mean, I. 11 for 266 and three touchdowns on Fantasy Championship Sunday. He threw up a 50 burger. Yep. 50. That was one of the damnedest performances I've ever seen. He broke all these rookie receiving records in the NFL. And then you got to look at Burrow threw for 525 last week and then just throws for 446 and 14. And not just that, against the Chiefs defense who shut everybody yeah. down the last two months. Yep. Everybody. He finished week 17 as fantasy QB1. Yard. It burst over almost 1,000 yards the last two weeks. And then you look at, you know, he goes to L- LSU in 19. They win the SEC in the national championship. And then a year or two when he gets Chase, they go from worst to first. There was so much debate on the Penny Sewell Chase NFL draft thing. People were saying, oh, y'all are an idiot for taking <laughs> Where are they now? <laughs> And then you look back on the funniest story of the whole year was Chase not being able to see the NFL ball in yes. preseason, which tanked, tanked his fantasy stock. I got it for 10 bucks in my league, and he won the championship for me. Yeah, it was quite a performance. And Jamar Chase has been very boomer bust this year. He had a great first half of the season, you know, capped by the 200 yard game, touchdown game against the Ravens, where the Bengals look to take the next step. And he kind of went silent. And it's like, did he hit his rookie wall? And he was having some bad games. But one thing about Jamar Chase after seeing him fully this year, he is without a doubt a primetime player. When the lights are on the brightest, he shows up the most. Yeah, and he did that in the national championship game against Clemson. And, man, the thing about him, I mean, you see all these freak receivers in the NFL. Did you see the Jets on him? On that, yeah. that first 70, did you watch the highlight of that first yeah. 70 yard touchdown? Jim Nance lost his mind. He was like, What year did this guy just hit? And, you know, part of what happened, maybe we talked about him in the rookie wall. Man, people started trying to take him away, and then T. Higgins and Boyd started going off. And so he directly influenced that. And so, man, what, what a season for him. And then Joe Burrow, the only thing I can compare it to is when Drew Brees went to New Orleans. Because oh. You know, you're talking about a losing franchise in the Bengals, a losing culture, and the Saints were definitely that before Breeze. And this dude just changes it all. And I thought Zach Taylor was a trash coach before the year. I, and Same. That, that take, you know, who knows, man? I mean, Joe Brady got all that credit at LSU, and then he bombed out of the NFL. Maybe it's just Burrow and Chase, you know? Yeah. Yeah. How how good do you think the Bengals are? Because I put out my NFL top 10 this morning. I have the Bengals, too. They have to be over two? Kansas City. Yeah. They have to be over Kansas City, who I had as two. I have Kansas City as three. I have Green Bay, Cincinnati, Kansas City, the Rams, and the Bucks as the top five. I, I mean, I definitely think top four or five. I'd look, when you look at the way that Bengals team is designed, they because Burrow's cheap and Chase is cheap on the rookie contracts, yep. they spend all that money on Trey Hendrickson, who's been awesome. Yeah. And they've got a bunch of veterans on D like Von Bell and you know, I guess I, I guess Mike Hilton and Eli Apple. They got some dudes though that are like solid, mm-hmm. you know. Maybe not the flashiest. Their defense isn't bad. Their offensive line's still a problem. Burrow's been sacked like 50 times. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, you got to try to protect him better, especially off that knee injury. But what a story. The Bengals hit my 10 to 1 to win the AFC North that I placed in late October or mid-October right before the key Ravens game. I said if they win this Ravens game, then they got a shot. They were like a six point underdog. That was the game Dave Portnoy bet 250 grand on them. Oh, I remember. It was that game. And then Chase went off for 201, Burrow went off for 400. Right when they won that game, they were a legitimate contender. And that's been a weird division. You know, Ravens, Browns, everybody's kind of gone through stuff this year. So Chase wins my fantasy league. 
I hit my 10 to 1 AFC North bet. And so Boston Bay Bengals merch to celebrate. <laughs> we know sure doing good, but we have Burt the Burrow, Chase Certs. A lot of LSU people have been buying them. Uh, but man, just what, what a story, though. One of the stories of the year in the NFL, the Bengals turn around. So I know the common phrase that part of my take has popularized is nobody cares about your fantasy team. But let's take a victory lap. Your fantasy team won in your big league. Just give us the roster. Okay. Championship. I won my championship game by 56 points. We came out and destroyed them. Patrick Mahomes and Taysom Hill at quarterback. Because, well, Hill's just rushing value. Sure, yeah. Uh, Carson Wentz is my number three. I went pretty much zero RB. And Aaron Jones was, like, pretty solid. Number two yesterday, i have been rotating for weeks. I had Rex Burkhead with 11 points. I almost started Jared Patterson. That's who I should have started. But whatever. Doesn't matter. You know why it doesn't matter with the zero RB theory? Because when you run out Cooper Cup, Jamar Chase, A.J. Brown, and Hunter Enfro, you're going to be pretty damn good. <laughs> and that receiving core was ridiculous. And I had Hunter Henry and then also picked up because I saw the meltdown that was happening with the Giants offense and the Eagles D going off last week. I put a big waiver claim in on the Bears and their defense went nuts yesterday. Yep. Glenn, Glennon was four for 17 for 20 yards. Yep. So yep. I put up like 170 something points in championship. I won by 50. And keep in mind, this is a team that. We had a four-way tie for two playoff spots, all at eight and six. I thought I did not win the tiebreaker, and then I was told that Tuesday morning, actually, you barely got in, and you did. And then I caught <laughs> fire and just spread it through the playoffs, and now I'm a champion. So, nice. Congratulations. And yeah, twice in three years, $500 league. So oh, are wow. you – we talked about this on Dear Mr. Fantasy yesterday. You negotiated a different split for first and second place. Do you regret doing that now? Yes. <laughs> Yes, but I will. Okay, what I did was we did 3,500 first, 2,500 second. I wish I'd have done 4K, 2K. 4,500, 1,500 is too, that's, that's too much. But it should have gone 4K, 2K. And I should have shown confidence because I thought I had the better team and my team was on fire. So that's what I get. But you know what? Whatever. I'm pumped to be in it. I thought I wasn't even going to make the playoffs. I'm a champion. And Patrick Mahomes and A.J. Brown were on my 19 – I won this league in 19 and 21, and I ran it back with my two two of my favorite guys in the NFL. So Nice. Uh, that's a lot of income on my fantasy team, but at least I'm a winner. And it makes <laughs> me feel like it justifies the pod. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, I can help that. So Ronan and I won the Barcel Fantasy League. Wire-to-wire -wire winners. We have a high score week one. Uh, finished number one in the regular season. We missed the points title by under two points. Um, but we dominated the playoffs. We had a tough game last week against the experts and the Miami Dolphins defense to, to pull out the win on Monday night, which they did thanks to a scrub team they played, the New Orleans Saints. Um, that, that wasn't an NFL team. <laughs> yeah. But uh, dominant performance yesterday, won by 27 points. Uh, half point PPR, super flex league, uh, three receivers. We had Kyler Murray, Justin Jefferson, Cooper Cup, Amari Cooper, scored Darrell Patterson, who kind of tailed off towards the end of the year, Darrell Williams. Gronk and then Trey Lance. We had AJ Dillon and Miles Sanders on the bench, along with Jimmy Garoppolo, uh, Davis Mills, Tyler Huntley, and DeAndre Hopkins, who was on injured reserve with the Chicago defense yesterday. Um, so, a dominant performance, um, wire to wire winners in that league. Um, very happy about that. So, um, Ron and I, the Yak, along with Big Cat, who is a very hands off manager, wasn't even really tangentially aware of the team until yesterday. Um, take on the take on the title. I think this goes even farther toward the zero RB stuff, though. You know, what was the common denominator? You having Jefferson and Cup. Yep. And, you know, I think that that's something I'm going to roll with going forward, man. I want to I'd talk rather have Dante Adams or Tyree Kill or somebody dominant first round than a running back that you get hurt. I want to talk about that for a minute because week 17, championship Sunday, right? Let's go over the top five running back performances from yesterday for fantasy. Number one. And this is my favorite, Rashad Penny. Two monster games in a row. So out there, there are people telling other people that Rashad Penny led them to a fantasy football championship, which is incredible. Rashad Penny, 31 and a half points and half point PPR. Then we had Darrell Williams, 24.2. Devin Singletary, 23 flat. Ramondre Stevenson, 
22.7, and Boston Scott, 22.6. This is half point PPR. Only one of them, maybe, which is Devin Singletary, was drafted. And he was drafted very late. Everyone else, undrafted. So I think as far as credence, the zero RB strategy, when you look apples to apples performances, yes, Jonathan Taylor, Austin Eckler, you know, those guys held up their end of the bargain. But there are so many other guys. The chances of you, it's not necessarily will this guy perform well because when Derrick Henry was on the field, he was, you know, the number one player in fantasy. It's more about the guys being on the field. So you're just playing a more risk averse version of fantasy by taking guys that are less likely to get hurt. Cause we look at, you know, the wide receivers that did well. Um, it is a little bit of a mixed bag. Jamar chase, Amon St. Brown, DK Metcalf, Devonte Adams and Braxton Berrios. Berrios not drafted. Amon St. Brown, maybe in keeper leagues very late. Um, Jamar chase absolutely was drafted. DK Metcalf and, and Devonte Adams were first, second, maybe third round guys. DK Metcalf. So, It just leads to more credence to these guys are going to be here later. And also the running backs just get so banged up late in the year that that's where you spend your waiver money. Yep. You know, you look at all these guys come on late in the year. You manage your roster on the zero RB. You use your waiver money. You pay attention. And then you spend your money on your top receivers and quarterback to maybe get an elite tight end. And I think that may be the optimal way going forward. Yeah, just kind of recapping. So for the year, these are the top 10 running backs. Jonathan Taylor, Austin Eckler, Joe Mixon, Najee Harris, Leonard Fournette, who is a very late pick. Zeke Elliott, James Conner, also very late pick. Our guy Scorderell Patterson, um, who is likely undrafted. Aaron Jones, and then Nick Chubb. So um, a a good group in there. All those guys, most of them high picks. Um, But, you know, the chances of you getting one of those guys... uh, is slim when you actually look at the full field. And that's actually what I want to transition to next is just looking at our preseason predictions and how we kind of net it out. And we can start with running backs there. So I haven't actually gone through this with Mincy. Um, so this will be a little bit of a surprise. So just looking at our top 25 um, rankings from the preseason, what were our biggest hits and misses? Um, I would say... I know my- I know my biggest hit's going to be Najee Harris because I I went hard for him. Uh, technically, yes. Well, technically, no, but I hear what you're saying. So you had Najee Harris ranked ninth going into the year. He finished fourth. So you were certainly higher on him than a, a lot of outlets, which is good. I had him 14th, so I certainly missed there. Um, biggest hit, Zeke Elliott. So you had him as five. I had him as seven. He actually finished as RB6, which is kind of surprising. Um. Let's see. Biggest miss, Damian Harris. We were both very low on. I had him as 41. I did a top 50. You had him unranked in the top 25. Um, My biggest hit was two guys, actually. Uh, Josh Jacobs, I had him as RB17. He finishes RB16. And Javante Williams, I had him as RB17. RB18, he finishes RB17. Um, Oh, and I also had the next guy, DeAndre Swift, right after as RB19. And that's my biggest hit. He was RB19. So I had those three stacked pretty well. Um, Both of our top guy, which was the unanimous top guy, Christian McCaffrey, way out of the top 25. Um, Obviously, injuries playing a a huge factor there because he was lightning when he was on the field. Um, But yeah, those those were probably biggest hits. Cordell Patterson, which we pumped up during the year. Um, He finished RB8. I'll give you credit credit for that. You you were on that more. Thank you. Thank you. Antonio Gibson, you were actually pretty on the money on two. You had him uh, 13th. He actually finished as RB12. So pretty good. Um, your ranking is pretty solid. The football team stuff I ended up about. Remember, we argued a lot on them, and I think I ended up. But honestly, Fitz bag. Patrick, Yeah. Well, Fitzy plays, you know, maybe it's different. You know? so. Yeah. Um, Antonio Gibson, um, I think you – yeah, I mean, we're both kind of mixed on him. He finishes RB12. You had him as 13. I had him as 9. Yeah, Fitz plays. Maybe it's a little bit different. He got hurt. What is the first quarter of the season? Yeah. But Heineke still had a DC year. I mean, he kind of struggled some. But, I mean, I don't think he was that big a downgrade. Yeah, no, absolutely. 
Um, wide receivers. So our claim to fame is going to be Cooper Cup just because we had him over Robert Woods, which I feel like nobody else did, which was weird. weird. Um, you had him as uh, a wide receiver 12. I had him as 13. He finished with one, obviously. Half point PPR, his ADP was 19. Um, and then overall, um, the highest I saw him was NBC Sports had him 19. Lindy's had him 27th. Um, yeah, a bunch of other places had him a lot lower than that. Um, biggest hit. Seat. Yeah, biggest hit for you. Devontae Adams finished a second. You had him as first. Um, I had him as second. He finished a second. You were also pretty on the nose with Justin Jefferson. You had him as sixth. He finished as fifth. Um, what are some other nice hits that you had? <laughs> I mean, I know I had Chase 24th, and then he did good, but... Yeah, I had Chase 25th, you had him 24th. He finished as wide receiver four. A mixed bag. A.J. Brown and D.K. Metcalf. A.J. got hurt. D.K. busted bad. I know I was big on both of them, obviously. The Ole Miss guys. Yeah. Um, Yeah, injury certainly played a factor in that. D.K. Metcalf... Um, where is he? He finished as wide receiver 11. Huge day yesterday. We both had him as wide receiver seven. Oh, wow. He finished as 11. It seemed like he did a lot worse than that. I mean, yesterday was a month. I mean, three touchdowns. Uh, that that'll happen for you. Um, but yeah, Stefan Diggs, I was more right on. I had him as wide receiver six. I expected a decrease. He definitely did. He finished as wide receiver seven. Um, but yeah, overall, overall, I think the rankings are solid. We both missed pretty bad on. DeAndre Hopkins, who had a major down year, also dealt with some injuries. Calvin Ridley, nothing you can really do about that. And uh, Where, I think you had Ridley ahead of me. I had him four. In. Yeah, you had him eight. He was nowhere to be seen. Um, and then AJ Brown, we both had him as a fifth ranked wide receiver. Terry McLaurin finished as wide receiver 26. I had him at nine. You had him as 18. So you were certainly way more right than I was on that. Um, last one I'll go through really quickly is quarterbacks. <laughs> Uh, your biggest miss certainly is going to be your 25th ranked quarterback going to the year. <laughs> Who, who's that? Jalen Hurts. <laughs> Jalen Hurts. Yeah, of course. Obviously. What am I saying? What did he finish top five? He finished as QB eight. Um, yeah, that's, that's a defining miss. That was like, yeah. Joe Burrow, I was actually very down on. I had him as QB 19. Um, he finished as quarterback eight. You had him as QB 12. I was only down on him due to the injury. I listened to, you know, I'm not going to blame. I listened to an internet football doctor <laughs> who said that he did not expect to be anywhere close to 100%. Um, Aaron Rodgers, surprising. So I actually nailed Aaron Rodgers as QB5. He did finish as QB5. Uh, you had him as QB10. Um, Josh Allen, I also nailed as QB1, finishing as QB1 back-to-back years. Wow. Even the yesterday's game. The rushing value, he had a horrible passing game and still had 20 points just off 80 yards rushing in two TVs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's for the most part the quarterback list, biggest hits, biggest misses. Um, yeah, the, the Ryan Tannehill at six is probably a mess by me. I think you probably need to mention that. Yeah, I was uh, I was way, way lower on him. I had him at 11th. Um, I don't know yeah, exactly where he finished, but way I outside the top the, 10. The flipping Tannehill and Rodgers in hindsight would have been much better yeah you also nailed matt stafford at qb7 he finishes qb7 i had him at eight so we were both kind of on the same page there um you were a little bit off on Dak, who you had fourth he finishes ninth dealt some injuries i had him at seventh um but overall pretty pretty solid rankings what is always actually very fun for me is i'll get dms and we get tagged in tweets sometimes about how we helped people win championships based on either the zero rb strategy or um our fantasy rankings and that is always very nice to hear and um we hope cooper to- cup, i've gotten a lot on the cooper cup thing yeah yeah absolutely a lot. we really went hard preseason on him and a lot of our guys just made a point to take him and they they were all very happy Yep. So hopefully we can bring you some winners like that for next year. But let's talk about that. So moving forward, what are we going to do? Um, again, this is the season finale of Fantasy Football Factory for this season. There's no more fantasy football. Um, but we did something kind of fun over break. Barcelona's been closed for two weeks and we've been doing some Twitter spaces about props. So talk about uh, that experience, what you want to do moving forward, Mincy. And I love doing the prop talk because I think... 
I've gotten to a point where the new the prop betting and the player props are like the new fun thing with gambling to me. And that's I know that's your specialty. Yeah. But I'm getting to where I like taking those instead of the over unders on the games. Definitely. You know, yeah. And I've gotten to where that that's become a really fun thing and uh, people love it. And we kind of did a, th- we've been doing the Thursday night ones. And what I'd like to do going forward is dear Mr. Fantasy on Sunday is over. Let's do Twitter spaces on props. Yep. And then maybe we try to do one when they come out, you know, some, it, the weird thing is we still don't know when they come out every week. It's not a consistent thing. Yeah. What's hard to kind of pull the curtain back is that, and we've alluded to this before props generally come out. They're based on, injury reports from practice so wednesday thursday friday practices things generally aren't solidified till friday night at the earliest and the covid thing unfortunately right with covid and a lot of guys being late scratches props this week weren't fully out till sunday morning so you know at that point we have to give fantasy advice because you know people are playing in their their fantasy title games and things like that playoffs we would like to make this a little more regular and scheduled. It is very difficult due to this, but in the coming weeks, we will be doing some Twitter spaces for, um, you know, uh, week 18 playoff games, things of that nature. We'll do something bigger on the Super Bowl with props as that's obviously, you know, the Super Bowl of props. Um, but yeah, it was very fun. I, I've, I've actually been putting out fewer picks online. Like my cards usually like 10 or so picks and I'll put out because I don't want to. <sighs> I always bet responsibly, but I don't want to give out all my picks because I know I, my confidence in them is not as high. I will put out my favorite pick every week and yeah. it will always be a it will almost always be a parlay. Definitely now moving forward. I think I have done that for the last several weeks. Um, yesterday, I hit I hit a plus seven, seven, nine on a four legger. Jonathan Taylor over one hundred seven and a half rushing yards. Jonathan Taylor scored a touchdown. I'm on St. Brown over. 56 and a half receiving yards or 57 and a half. Um, and then Sony Michelle over 71 and a half rushing yards. Let me tell you something. I, I keep track of my bets. My percentage is horrendous, but yeah, but it's more, you take I am, I am, I am up uh, just under 20 units on the year. And my favorite play, which I've tracked, I've done and released online specifically titled my favorite play 14 times. It's seven and seven, and I'm up sixty units on that. I obviously go. I obviously go heavier on that one. Um, Good job. But that that is the play. So I will I will definitely be keeping the people abreast of when of when those come out. Uh, I almost had a monster TD prop yesterday too, which was good. But um, yeah, I like doing these Twitter spaces because we actually get people to speak and kind of give some props on the on there on kind of what they think and that's always very helpful like the what was it two weeks ago we did the Niners Titans game on Thursday night and we had yeah. people from Tennessee and San Francisco kind of giving us the inside scoop essentially from the local market on on the team and the injury reports and that type of thing yeah I love it man and I, I think I want to keep it going and you know also we want to help do this to build the more still sports book and the brand then yeah I think it make, makes a lot of sense. The parlay thing is really, really fun. You can't judge your record because you're doing all parlays. Of course, your yes. record's going to be bad. You know, you yeah. can't – you're not betting them straight. And I kind of like you just selecting your favorite picks thing too because, I mean, people that follow what happened to me on Pick Central this year, when you go high volume – and Big Cat's done this before too. Right. When you go high volume, you get burned. you got to be selective yeah. uh, to win consistently. And that's – I got burned on that this year. And so I think it's good to just pick your favorites. Yeah. Um, so that has been really fun and I do very much appreciate anyone that tails, um, and rides with me. And, you know, I do like interacting uh, throughout the day. Um, yeah, that was, that was pretty much all I had. Um, we can talk about briefly. Mac Jones had a big day yesterday, three touchdowns. <laughs> well, I mean, the Mac Jones versus Trevor Lawrence game, but I mean, Lawrence, this, I mean, what can you even say about this Jags thing? I mean, it's just, they're, they're not even, they're like a, you know, a semi pro team at this point. Um, I don't have too much to say on that. I had a really good time at the New Orleans game. Uh, I was in a suite yesterday. Very – not a lot happening in the first half. Fastest – first half lasted one hour. Fastest first <laughs> half of an NFL game I've ever seen. <laughs> Looked up, it was 425, and it was halftime. Four times. It was crazy. The, the, it was a 325 game, and it ended at like 610. Wow. <laughs> um, but fourth quarter, a lot of fun, rocking. Cam Jordan's still badass. Uh, Saints defense is great. The offense isn't. 
Right. Uh, people that call me a mush, the Saints are three and zero when I'm there, and five and eight when I'm not this year. So suck it. Yes, I was getting tweeted a lot um, by people to leave the stadium yesterday when the Bucks were losing. I don't know who started that. I did see Billy Football tweeted like, "Whatever you do, just stay there and keep watching the game." <laughs> so to Billy Football, <laughs> suck it. I did stay there. I watched Tom Brady fucking beat your sorry ass team. <laughs> Oh, man. But, yeah, great year of fantasy. You want to thank our team, too, man. We've yes. got a great team. Richie and Marty have done – and Madeline have done phenomenal jobs for us. And, you know, it's, it's – the Dear Mr. Fantasy has done really well every Sunday and the interaction. And, you know, we're going to keep going with these props, keep, keep doing the dang thing. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah, we are excited. So, I guess until next year, thank you guys for uh, following us, for watching, for listening. And hopefully we can bring you to another – I want to, I don't want to say title next year, but let's let's that's obviously the goal. But let's let's try and have a good draft again next year. Yeah, but hey, both of us champions too. So I love yep. getting to sign out on that note. Love it. All right. See you guys. Thank you.